evening. Folks, my name is Adam Kane. I'm the executive director of the Fairbanks Museum, and I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening for this important and timely Eddy lecture. So as you can imagine, for the Fairbanks Museum, this has been a really challenging year, as it has been for you know, nearly everyone in, in one way or another. And so for the Fairbanks Museum, we have continued our work to inspire wonder, curiosity, and responsibility for the natural world, although frankly, it looks a lot different than it did before. This Eddy lecture is a, is a case in point. Uh, and as we look towards 20, 2021, and with an optimism that this year is going to rebound, I would uh, like to ask a favor of this group of folks who is listening, who uh, I know many are supporters of the Fairbanks Museum. Um, so we, we are able to do the work we do through uh, membership. Our Fairbanks Museum members make everything we do possible. So we are offering uh, a special discount on membership tonight. So a normal family membership is $75. Uh, we're offering that for $50 tonight. That there's going to be a link posted in the chat for you to become a Fairbanks Museum member. And I strongly encourage you to do that, not just to support the Fairbanks Museum, but also to look for look to this year as um, a time where uh, we're going to be able to travel in a way that was different than last year, we hope anyway, because that Fairbanks Museum membership through our uh, participation with the Association of Science and Technology Centers gets you in free to nearly every science center across the country. So purchase that Fairbanks Museum membership, support the Fairbanks Museum, and then go and use it to travel to other science museums in a way that we weren't able to do last year. So that would be greatly appreciated by the Fairbanks Museum. And I should add that that sponsorship is brought to you specifically by Maple Grove Farms. They're, they've been great sponsors of ours and they are subsidizing membership for this uh, presentation tonight. So this lecture that we're gonna hear tonight is the first in a two part series. Uh, part two is on May 5th at 7 p.m. It's a, um, a panel presentation called Exploring Vermont's Climate. And so it's a panel presentation that has four presenters. So it includes tonight's speaker, speaker Dr. Leslie Ann Dupini Giraud, who is a Vermont state climatologist. We'll be hearing a lot from her in just a moment. Dr. Janelle Hanrahan, who is the chair of the atmospheric sciences at Northern Vermont University. Uh, Dr. Ryan Rebozo, the director of conservation science at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Our own Steve Molesky, a meteorologist at the Fairbanks Museum. And that, is, that panel discussion will be hosted by VPR's Jane Lindholm. Um, so we expect a really robust, interesting discussion on where Vermont's climate is going. That's on May 5th. We look forward to seeing you there. So for tonight's presentation, uh, we're going to be hearing from uh, Dr. Dupini Giraud. And uh, as, as you listen to her presentation, if you have questions, you can put those questions in the chat. We have a whole team of folks who are working behind the scenes uh, on that information to make sure that your questions get answered at the end of, of her presentation. So to that team, there is a 10-member EDI lecture committee, which uh, provides guidance for this presentation. And then the three people who are really working behind the scenes are Allison Dolka mallard Karina Weiss, and Anna Rubin. So uh, big thanks to them for, for making all this work. So the Eddy Lecture Series was envisioned by Bill Eddy as a program to broaden our views and understanding of the world. And I think tonight's speaker will do just that. Dr. Leslie Ann dupini Giraud is a professor of climatology in the Department of Geography at the University of Vermont and Vermont State Climatologist. She is the president of the American Association of State Climatologists, a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, a fellow of the African Scientific Institute, and a fellow of the Vermont Academy of Science and Engineering. She is a, she's a lead editor of uh, Historical Climate Variability and Impacts in North America, which is the first monograph to deal with the use of documentary and other ancillary records for analyzing climate variability and change. Nationally, she is the lead author for the Northeast chapter of the Fourth National Climate Assessment of the U.S. Global change research program, and she has served on the NOAA Science Advisory Board Working Group 
and serves as the co-chair of Vermont's Drought Task Force and was recently appointed to the Vermont Climate Council. So all that is to say, she is the expert. <laughs> um, so from here, I'm going to turn it over to, to Dr. Dupini Giroux and uh, we look forward to hearing her presentation. Thank you, Adam. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here this evening. It is such a joy and privilege to actually um, kick off the, this um, year's uh, Eddie Lecture Series and to share a little bit about some of the things that I've been working on or some of my experiences in, in being a climatologist for the last um, number of decades. And I know we have um, um, a number of different age groups in our audience today. So hopefully I have something just a little bit special for, for everyone. Um, I also see a number of familiar faces in the participants. So I'm gonna give a little shout out to all the folks who I know are, are in the audience and I hope to, to become a, a, a true and deep member of the entire um, Fairbanks family as we move forward. So with that, um, Today, what we're going to talk a little bit about is climate, climate change, um, and some of the, the implications that those have for us as Vermonters. And we're going to do a little bit of um, audience participation. We're also going to do a little bit about um, understanding the various elements of, of, of our climate, how climate changes. Where if we have some time towards the end, and I know we may have some questions about uh, the snow that we have outside right now, uh, we'll, we'll try and get to, to some of those Q and A. And thank you so much for having already submitted a lot of questions in the Google Doc, and I try to actually address and answer some of those as we, st we step forward. So today is the 21st of April, and tomorrow is Earth Day. So happy Earth Day, one day in advance, everybody. Uh, the first Earth Day took place in 1969, and it was all due to the fact that once we're able to see what our Earth looks like from above, it sort of helps us to see how all connected everything is. We as, as human beings, um, us to the landscape and all those various pieces in there. And so some satellite imagery are crit absolutely critical in helping us to understand um, weather, climate, climate change, and all of the various pieces that affect us as human beings. So happy Earth Day. I know there are a lot of activities being planned. Some of them um, are going to be remote, but to the extent that we can celebrate all the, the achievements that we've had for the last 51 years, it's, it's a great time to be um, doing this. So I'm the Vermont State Climatologist, and I have been in that particular position as a faculty member at the University of Vermont for the last 24 years. And part of that comes a responsibility to provide uh, a number of different services to, to Vermonters and to um, residents across the Northeast. And those, those include things like uh, communication, research, outreach, understanding of various elements of our, our weather and climate system. And back in 2008, I'm very fortunate to have had the opportunity to host the entire organization in, in Burlington. And if you look really, really closely, you might see some familiar faces. So, for example, I know Bruce is in, in, the, in, in the audience here. And so I just wanted to give a little shout out. Hey, Bruce. Um, as, as being a, a staunch supporter of, of the office for, for all of these decades. And so thinking about that, thinking about how long we've been doing weather and climate in the state, um, there's a building on, on Main Street in Burlington. If, if you've ever driven on, on Main Street, you'll see this little square building. And it was if the former site of the US Weather Bureau, which then became um, NOAA. And so during the, the celebration that we had of our state climatologists, um, the National Weather Service um, was, was the, the instigator for actually having a plaque um, installed on, on this building here, which now hosts the, the, the ROTC um, cadets at, at UVM. But it, it talks about all of, of the contributions that were made by meteorologists in the, the 1800s who took weather records and launched weather balloons from the top of these weather buildings. And if you look really, really closely, you will see one of those um, weather stations, the um, uh, Stevenson screen, where they have all of the temperature 
measurements and so forth being made just at the front here back at that particular time. So this was back in the um, late 1800s and early 1900s when this particular building served that purpose. So UVM is a land-grant institution, which means that part of the mission of, of the institution is to provide outreach and research and service to the state. And so it's, it's very... Um, um, it's one of my privileges to serve in, in this particular capacity. And so I've been giving a lot of these talks over the last uh, few months or so, uh, particularly to uh, students, student groups, climate clubs across not just Vermont, but across the entire U.S. And a lot of times people say, how did you get involved in climatology? How did you know what you wanted to do? Why do you do what you do? And so um, I started doing a lot of this reflection. Part of it is because I'm really, really curious about the natural world. I'm really, really curious about why things are where they are and how the interconnections sort of fit. And I think I was really, really fortunate and privileged to have a, a lot of role models and, and mentors, particularly in high school, who allowed me to, to sort of understand what are the pieces in learning about science, whether it's physics or biology or marine science or climatology or geography or chemistry and how all these pieces fit together in an integrated way. And part of, of, of learning about that is the sort of um, responsibility and, and core value that comes with giving back to the community for all of the many, many riches that I've received over so many years. And so that's a lot of, of, of why I do what I do in, in this particular capacity. And so um, folks have asked me, how did you get your start? Why, why did you do what you do? Uh, how did your education sort of fit into it? And so um, they, I've been sort of featured in a number of different um, places that, that talk about um, using and understanding your background to, to help with um, getting the word out, particularly around climate and climate information, climate literacy. And the last 14 months in the number of change that we've seen, not just across the U.S., but across the, the world, um, including our pandemic, have, have led me to sort of think a lot about who I am as a person, who I am as a scientist, and to, to, to speak to this notion of what's called intersectionality, which means how do all of my um, identities um, intersect with the work that I do, and how do I articulate that and explain that so that it makes sense, um, especially for, for, for folks who might be trying to, to, to pick a career and, and want to know how did I pick the career that I did. This notion of, of intersectionality might look something like this. I'm a faculty member. I'm part of the American Association of State Climatologists. I've served a number of, of different uh, roles nationally. Um, I've, I've been invited to the World Meteorological Organization to, to give um, various talks. And so using all of that then allows me to, to explain um, who I am, the work that I do, and why do I do what I do. And uh, last year... There was a, a group in, in England called Futurum Careers, which is what you see on, on the bottom of this screen here, who asked me to think about um, all of the things that I do with K through 12 students, with K through gray, in helping everyone to understand whether climate, climate change and so forth. And they put together this little blurb called In the Know, Building a Climate Literate Society. And part of that is because this group works really, really closely with students, parents, and teachers across the entire world to help them to understand how different scientists um, do what they do. And so part of, of the, the activities that, that I've been working with a, the K through 12 environment here in the state, they, they put together these activities, really, really cool activities that sort of um, allow teachers to then take some of these materials that have been developing. And part of them were developed in conjunction with, with uh, Dr. Bruce Behrman, who's also on this call, um, to use those in classrooms, to use those to, to, to think about ways of interacting with our, our, our landscape and, and understanding our weather, understanding our, our climate. The other piece that is critically important for me is you cannot pick a subject, you cannot pick a major, you cannot pick a field uh, career if you haven't heard about it. And so knowing that and, and, and trying to understand and, and 
respond to that challenge, um, one of the things that I did in conjunction with a number of other colleagues across the U.S. was to create what was called a diversity climate network, where I did go out to, to, to high schools across um, parts of New York, parts of, 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 of Vermont, and talk about climate, talk about weather, talk about geography, talk about some of the career trajectories that you could be pursuing if you were interested in this particular field. And then the last thing that's critically important to me in terms of serving as a, as a role model is um, traditionally, historically, um, the atmospheric sciences, the climate sciences, climatology, um, has not been well represented in terms of, of gender. And so um, there are not always, or traditionally have not always been a lot of role models for students coming up through the ranks to look up to. So critically important for me to, to help to step into that role and to serve as a, as a role model as, as I am able. So let's get into the, the, the heart of what we are here to, to talk a little bit more about, which is climate and, and climate change. So. There's this, 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 this massive explosion in terms of interest, in terms of need, in terms of our, 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 our use of, of all these different ways of looking at climate, and whether it is from a resilience perspective, whether it's from a human health, um, air pollution perspective, whether it is how all of this affects our infrastructure, particularly transportation, whether we're in a drought right now, whether our energy um, supplies are being affected, whether our grid is resilient, all of these are things that that we are uh, particularly sensitive to, especially in the last few decades or so. So we have some polling questions for you. And I'm gonna invite um, Allison to go ahead and start the, the first question. So my first question to you is, how old is the word climate? So I'm gonna pause for a little bit here. And this is, this is your opportunity to, to start voting. How old is the word climate? And this is the fun part because with a live poll, you see all these sliders kind of going back and forth here. So this is going to be interesting. And it looks like we are on a countdown here. So 64 plus. 36 that, oh, those numbers just changed again. All right, 79% voted. Okay, so 65% said over 200 years and that would be correct because the word climate comes from the ancient Greek word klima. And the person who this word klima is attributed to is actually Aristotle. So we're talking really more than 200 years. So this, this notion of, of climate coming from the word klima, what does klima mean? Well, it means the, the angle with which all of the energy that we get from the sun comes in. And if we, if we think about it, um, some places get pretty much direct rays coming in from the sun all the time. And those, of course, are your tropical regions. And then other places that are um, at an angle to how the sun's coming in get varying amounts of, of sunshine. So some more in one season and, and less in other seasons. And in other words, we in the mid-latitudes. And then some places get pretty much zero or close to zero, which would be your poles. So this, this understanding of how much energy is coming in is critically important because the energy from the sun is what drives all of the processes that we experience here on the Earth's surface. So climatology is a branch of meteorology in terms of our understanding, in terms of how do we put a lot of these patterns together. So super awesome. Now, Climatology is a, a branch of meteorology, and there are about 10 ways that we can look at, at climatology. And I'm going to just focus in on this one, this, this one branch of, of climatology, which I ha actually happen to be. I'm an applied climatologist. And what applied climatologists do is to use weather and climate information to look at, to define, to interpret, to explain 
how things like weather patterns, climate and extreme events are affecting various sectors of society that are critically important to us as human beings. So for example, buildings or agriculture or the economy or in insurance or some of the other decisions that we make. And this particular branch of, of climatology where we're, we're directly focusing on the, the needs of society, this actually dates back to the 1850s. So we did a lot of agricultural services um, in using climate information all the way back in, in the 1850s. And so applied climatology actually has its roots um, over 150 years ago. So thinking of all of the various moving pieces, so the energy coming from the sun, the, the energy that the earth gives off, where is it precipitating? So is it rain like it was last week, or is it snow like it is today? Where are all of these clouds um, giving us precipitation? How does all that precipitation move through the system? Did you get enough to replenish your water supply? Did you get enough to replenish your aquifers? And if the answer is no, we're in a drought. So, so when we think about climate, we think about um, energy flows and, and, and cloud patterns and precipitation and moisture and the ways in which we use water, the ways in which vegetation responds to all of the, the, the energy and the moisture that's in the system itself. So all of these bits of information come from a wide variety of places, including just observing and taking pictures, which I absolutely love to do. They come from um, actual uh, weather measurements. So you see uh, a couple of these from some of the, the cooperative stations that are um, in selected places across the state. Uh, they come from weather balloons, which go up through the sky and tell you how the, the the atmosphere is changing. They come from satellite images, and then they come from actual models that um, tell us the forecast for uh, a particular region. So satellite images are amazing. They're awesome. They're part of the reason why we have Earth Day. And it, they also allow us to look at, at changes over um, longer periods of time. So one of the, the, the ways in which we can um, look at, at our change in climate is to use remotely sensed or satellite data that show us, for example, the recession of, of glaciers on land and, and the ways in which they, they have not come back and are not coming back. Another way that we can get this these data that go beyond just satellites or go beyond just when we started making measurements is to use these historical records. And though um, there are a number of, of historical records that are absolute treasure troves for, for me as a climatologist in, in, in diaries that you may have in your possession, they may have belonged to your parents, your grandparents, or your forebears. And the really, really important part in, in, in these is that they actually used to capture the weather every single day. And so when, when I locate one of these, it, it's an actual um, treasure trove in, in terms of looking at these information. We also have, have um, individuals and scientists um, like Hiram Cutting, who are these amazing uh, natural historians who have made these observations and actually sort of recorded and captured them for posterity in their own publications, like the Climatology of Vermont, uh, which dates back to, to 1877. And then, you know, in some of the more official records like this one here from Burlington, you can actually see when they talked about snow falling on the top of Mount Mansfield in June in, in 1842. So additional to these written records are some uh, pictures, which again sort of supplement a lot of the, the, the ways that we can understand our weather and our climate. And again, you may have some of these um, pictures either in your possession or in historical societies. And again, those are absolute um, gold mines for climatologists because they allow us to understand how things were in particular times back in the past. So here's my second question for you. When do you think the term climate change was first used. So again, I'm going to invite Alison to pop back up our, our question here so that we can do this the second poll. Oh, there's a tight race going on here.
still a tight race. All right, we've got 79% of uh, folks voting. A oh, couple more. All righty, 82%. All right, wow, that's an even split here. So we've got 35% for 1950 and another 35% for before 1940. Okay, so the term climate change, climate changes, was actually used at least as far as I can see around the late 1800s in the geologic literature. And it was used in, in context of um, Krakatoa, which erupted in, in Indonesia in the, the late 1800s, and actually was so um, explosive of an eruption with so much material being extruded into the atmosphere that it, it led to the cooling of the earth for at least five years right after that particular event. And so that's one of the very first times that I've been able to go back and see the word climate changes in the written literature. And like I said, it was in, in the geologic literature. And so this, this understanding is very, very well captured by this particular um, online article from NASA that talked about the year without a summer, which is 1816, which is back even further in time with Tambora and the way in which that explosion um, created uh, cooling for at least two or three years after. And the, the, the amount of these materials that led to the cooling back in, in, in the 1800s as a result of these uh, particular eruptions were actually captured not just in the geologic literature, but also in our popular literature. So um, Frankenstein was written around the time right after the Krakatoa event. Um, the famous painting called The Scream, where you see, you know, like this, this red thing and it looks like that, was also painted right around that time as well. So there are a lot of sort of um, cultural references that go back to some of these pieces that we can uh, trace back through in the historical record. So when we think about climate change, we think about all of the various pieces that are either changing or becoming more variable. And part of it is... Um, uh, greenhouse gases being added to the atmosphere, so carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, methane, um, ozone, um, and the ways in which those change, how much energy we have in the atmosphere and where there's warming and where there's cooling. But if we warm somewhere and cool somewhere else, that means our winds are also going to change. And if the winds change, we're going to see changes in clouds and rainfall and so forth. And so thinking of climate change as an entire system where all of these things are interconnected, which is what you see a lot of on this left-hand side here with all of these arrows. Some of them are going in two directions because well, they, they, they have these mutual um, impacts on each other. So using that, that understanding and using the fact that we have been able to go back to the 1800s to look at, at, at climate change from a longer period of time, um, this is a, a, an animation that we're going to show you that was created by, by NASA. And what it, it is going to show you is um, every five years, it's going to show you what the temperatures are across the entire globe. So it's going to start in 1880, it's going to jump to 1885, 1890. And every time it goes through that five-year jump, you're going to see how the temperatures have changed. And they're changing um, relative to an average period. And the average period is 1951 to 1980. So I'm going to play this. And as you look at it, the blue areas are colder than that average period. And the, the yellows and the reds and the oranges are warmer than that average period. And you're going to see it kind of ebbs and flows. And then I want you to kind of pinpoint some dates where things really, really changed. So just hit the 1900s and the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, 
1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000, 2010s, and now the last period. And so one of the things that you noticed is the, 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 the year that I wanted you to kind of clue in on was that 1980, when, when the, the, the signal really, really became pronounced and continuing um, particularly warm ever since then. So um, the last few years have been some of the warmest on record. And you see that pr um, really, really pronounced piece across the, the Northern Hemisphere, which you know is where most of the land is. And that's part of the reason why you see um, a lot of the warming taking place in, in our hemisphere in here. So our third and final question from a polling perspective. Uh, so which of the following, and you're going to have a choice in here, which of the following are examples of impacts of climate change? So um, for the final time, Alison, if you wouldn't mind, here we go. So we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five choices in here. And we're looking for which ones are impacts of climate change. Okay, we're up to 82% voted. All righty, almost unanimous, all of the above, and that would be correct. All of the above in terms of the ways in which we understand our acts of climate change. So. A lot of them were actually drawn from this diagram here, which is one of my favorite diagrams because it shows you sort of like, what do we do that causes climate to change? And that's on the left-hand side here. And then it shows you the response to that. So the, the ways in which we see climate change, whether it's um, ocean acidification or whether it's um, changed in, in energy, whether it's birds arriving earlier, whether it's um, less snowpack, whether it's um, harmful algal blooms, all of those are in the middle here. And then on the last side here, the green side, it's some of the strategies that we can employ. So either the mitigative strategies to reduce things like greenhouse gases or some of the adaptation strategies in terms of maybe changing the, the, the plants that we um, grow or, or so forth in, in, in trying to make sure that we try to address uh, a change in climate, either from a mitigative perspective or from an adaptation perspective. And then this last way of, of, of thinking about climate change um, is, is, is more graphical. And so in, in the geologic record, we see some examples of this going from one state to the next, and we have a jump in between. Um, we see increases in temperatures, and, and that's another way of looking at, at, at climate change. And the one that I, I'd like to sort of, of highlight is this, this notion of things getting more and more variable over time. And the reason I, I, I like to highlight that is because we as human beings, we as societies tend to have um, adapted to be in like a certain range, like a certain temperature range, certain moisture range. And then when it gets outside of that, like when we have lots of floods and lots of droughts, or when we have uh, lots of heat waves, lots of cold waves, that's when it puts additional stressors on us, right? And before um, 2020, we had those climate stressors, and now we have COVID-19 adding a, an additional stressor on there, and so um, exacerbating a lot of the human vulnerability that we see across the board. So how does this kind of play out? So this, these are, are graphs of Lake Champlain, and they show you for, for four different years the heights of Lake Champlain. So the, the lowest line is the same in all of them. It shows you the lowest that Lake Champlain has ever gotten. The, the top line is the highest that the lake has ever gotten. And then the, the, the one that changes, this, this sort of purple line is the one that is for that particular year. 
And I'm going to pull out two for, for us for today. Um, 1927, which is this one here. And you'll notice that 1927, we went from being close to being dry to actually causing the flood of record for most of the northern part of the state. Okay, so we've got, we go to have this tendency of going from uh, droughts to floods in the state, right? And we can see that in, in this year. We also saw that in 2011, where we were actually in um, sort of like drought conditions here before Hurricane Irene hit. And so this, this, this idea of going from floods to droughts, those excesses, those going beyond those bars is important for us uh, as a state. So the question is, before it started to rain last week, and even with today's snow, we're still in a drought. So the question then becomes, how can you be in a drought if A, it's raining, and B, if climate change uh, projects it to be wetter here in the state? And, and part of, of, of that is to understand a little bit about um, how droughts occur and how they can sort of play out over time. And so... Um, we have been dry pretty much all the way back to June of last year. And this is just showing us going back to October. And again, the usual color scheme where reds are on the low end or the um, quote unquote um, less desirable end, and then greens are on, on the higher end. So if, if we look at it, we'll notice, especially across the kingdom, we've been getting really, really deficits in terms of our precipitation for a long period of time. And so that's part of the reason why we still are in a drought, even if we are getting precipitation, even if we're getting rain or snow in the last couple of days. Why? Because when we are dry for this long, not only does the soil dry out, but the aquifers and all of our groundwater supplies dry out. And in addition to all of that, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's been really, really dry. And so when the air is that dry, it actually helps to, to, to pull the, the water out of the landscape, out of the, the, the rivers, out of your, your streams, out of your vegetation. And so it sort of um, worsens or exacerbates the, the dry conditions. So again, when, when you see that we're like down in the 98% dry, that just tells us exactly how dry we've been for, for a long period of time. So we see that in our, 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 our groundwater. And last week we were actually hitting sort of like record lows in terms of our streams in terms of our groundwater because it it took a while to dry out so it's going to take a while to actually fill back up so if i put all of these diagrams together here's the low amounts of precipitation here are my streams and you see the streams even this is from yesterday the streams are still very very low and the, the wells, your groundwater is also very, very low. So like I said, it takes a while to get in, so it's going to take us a while to come back out. So um, we had this alert that went out last week. We're going to probably have an, another alert tomorrow that says pretty much the same thing, where that drought continues across the, the North Country because of, of the length of time that it's been occurring. So I'm going to switch gears for a little bit here um, and use some of that background to talk about some of the things that I was able to, to bring to bear in putting together, um, leading the Northeast chapter for the National Climate Assessment. Uh, the National Climate Assessment, um, it came out in two pieces back in 2018, and the second piece, the second volume, talked about all of the impacts of climate change, all of the things that we are at risk at as human beings, and then what are some of the adaptation strategies that we could actually sort of bring to bear. So um, when we look at it, we can sort of do this by region, and for us in the Northeast, so here we are up in here, for us in the Northeast, we're particularly... Um, susceptible to, to water and energy and trans, our transportation infrastructure and the ways in which um, those are, are being affected by floods and heat waves and droughts and, and storms. And this is a little bit hard to read. My apologies for that because it's a tiny diagram. I'd be more than happy to either send a copy of this or to point you to the website that, that has um, all of these. So you can actually see what it looks like uh, across the entire region here. So I had to give a presentation on all of the different regions that you saw in the previous map. And 
I, I went through and I read all of those regions to see what we were, were talking about. And a lot of the things were common. So we all talked about about um, climate change impacts on human health. Uh, we talked about um, the ways in which climate change affects our indigenous peoples. We talked about um, changes in agricultural productivity, infrastructure, ecosystem services, and so forth. So let me walk you through the five key messages, the five key highlights that we, we talked about for the Northeast. And as I said before, I'm more than happy to um, point you in the direction of where to find this so that you can go through it um, a little bit at your leisure once you have a chance to do so. So the first thing we talked about is we're seeing changes in our seasons. We're seeing changes um, in uh, the ways in which um, precipitation, moisture, extremes, and so on are affecting our forests, affecting our wildlife, affecting our stream flow, the timing of it, snowpack, and so forth. And it also is affecting our economies, particularly in, in the rural parts of the Northeast. So, so why did we focus on, on, on rural aspects? And, and it's because if you look at a map of the Northeast, most of the Northeast is, is pretty rural. So with the exception of uh, Boston and New York and DC and parts of New Jersey, most of the Northeast is rural. So it, it actually is, is, is critical to look at how climate change is being ex experienced in the Northeast. And because agriculture is part of our rural landscape, we can look at uh, the changes in the growing season. So on the left-hand side is a, the last time that it freezes in the spring. On the right-hand side is the first time that it freezes in the fall. And what this map is trying to show is how the growing season is changing because the number of days are changing of when that first freeze occurs in the fall and when the last freeze occurs in the spring. So we can look at that and, and, and try to think about what that means for our cropping patterns. We can also look at this from a stream flow perspective. And so the, the way to look at this diagram is if, if the, you see triangles and they're pointing downwards, it means that our, our spring um, snow melt is coming earlier. And as you look at this uh, across most of the Northeast in here, you're seeing snow melt is coming earlier. And for parts of, of, of Vermont, it's coming anywhere between five and 10 days earlier. And so let me blow this up a little bit. So this um, next set of, of, of figures here is from the same author who contributed that previous slide. And on the left-hand side, you're looking at changes in summertime rainfall. And on the right-hand side, you're looking at changes in summertime storm flow conditions. So this time around, if the, the triangles are pointing up, it means we're getting more precipitation. So you're seeing that across the board, that we're getting more summertime precipitation. And again, triangles are pointing up. The storm flow is also going up as well. So we're, we're looking at how those play out for us. So that was the first key message. The second key message talked about the fact that uh, parts of the Northeast are, are also coastal. We've also got an ocean component in there. And so trying to understand the changes that are taking place in the ocean, which are actually changing faster than any other oceans for the, the U.S., the changes in the Northeast are occurring faster. What does that mean for our ecosystems in the coast? What does that mean for ecosystem services? What does that mean for um, folks who derive their livelihoods from, from coastal activities. And in, in looking at that, we can um, think about, this is where some of that sea level rise comes in. It, it also um, allows us to think about uh, all of the major cities that are along the coast and, and what the sea level rise um, uh, mean for, for changing patterns, whether it it's thermal patterns, whether it's flooding patterns, are so critically important to look at our coastal regions. And then because we are uh, a region that has rural and urban, um, there's this sort of um, handshaking between our urban regions and our coastal regions. There's a lot of interconnections, both in terms of peoples, in terms of culture, in terms of our, our economics, our socioeconomic patterns and, 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 and viability. And when we think about these urban areas, not only are they connected to, to the rural areas, but they also have some, some key 
um, vulnerabilities, and a lot of them have to do with our infrastructure. Why? Because the Northeast is one of the places where we've had human settlement for the longest period. And so a lot of our infrastructure is some of the oldest in the nation, and a lot of our historical sites are also some of the oldest in the nation. So we need to think about what does that mean for either um, changing precipitation, changing um, flood levels in, in some of our urban regions in here. So um, places like Annapolis, uh, Maryland, that have a lot of, 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 of flooding uh, in, in the recent times, what does that mean for tourism? What does it mean for um, economic activities in that region there? And part of the challenge is to, to, to learn from the events that we've seen in the recent past or in the more distant past. And so in New York City, when um, Hurricane Sandy came through, a lot of the subways flooded. And so when New York rebuilt after that, what they did is they actually um, raised the grates over the, the, the subways so that the water didn't rush directly in from the street. And so what you see is a multi a multi-purpose um, grate where you, you have um, benches for, for pedestrians, you have bike racks, but also you have like a six inch, at least six inch gap so that the water doesn't run in. The fourth key message is our, our, our human health piece. And whenever I give a talk, this is one of the pieces that I always get questions about because when we look at changes in, in temperature, when we look at changes in moisture, when we, we think about uh, change in air quality, especially uh, when that relates to our topography, how is this going to play out for us um, in terms of either um, hospital room visits or changes in respiratory ailments? All of these are critically important. And so um, we, we need to sort of start thinking about our vulnerability from a human health um, perspective. And so um, one of our authors actually um, is an epidemiologist. And so this is some of, of the work that he brought to that chapter in looking at uh, some of these increases in emergency room visits as a result of, of all of these changes that we're seeing in our climate. And then the last key message is that the Northeast is an absolute leader in terms of some of the adaptation strategies and programs that are currently in place, that have been in place, that continue to be implemented. And so it's a great sort of lessons learned in, in being able to be exemplars for other regions. And so this last key message talked about some of the, 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 the strategies that we've been implement, implementing here in Vermont and also across the Northeast in some of these adaptations. So this was a, a very much a, a team effort in here. And if um, a lot of the, the additional pieces like the, the mapping, like the case studies um, are, are, are all, um, I give my thanks to all of our technical contributors. And here is, is the website that you might want to make a note of. So it's NCA 2018 dot global change dot gov that's the main website for the fourth national climate assessment and then uh, just look for the northeast chapter so it can like i said walk you through a little bit more of some of the things that we've seen across in here so that's that's sort of like the top part of the funnel let's let's come on down a little bit to what does it mean for us in the state so what does climate change look like here in the state and we showed some lake champlain um, graphs before. Why Lake Champlain? Well, if you think about Lake Champlain, it, it actually serves as a, an integrator of, of climate and, and patterns on both sides. So on the Adirondack side, which is what you see here, but also on the Vermont side, because from a moisture perspective, everything sort of drains into the lake, right? And so we're looking to see the ways in which the lake is changed or has changed. And so one thing that I know um, we can look at is is the days or the dates when the, the lake has uh, frozen completely, so the, the ice out, and, and the fact that that is occurring less and less frequently in the recent time here. Very, very similar to some of the things that we do when we look at Joe's Pond, for example, and sort of trying to predict when Joe's Pond is going to ice out or when it's going to melt and, and so forth. So, so water bodies are a great way of, of looking at that climate change signal in here. The way that we could look at climate change is what are called backward springs or fault springs. And uh, we're seeing that again this year. We saw it last year. We've seen it quite often in, in, in the recent past. And that's when, you know, the temperatures um, started to, to go up as they, they should in, in spring. And then they take a nosedive like we've 
we've seen last week, like we're seeing again today. And in some cases, uh, snow. So again, we're seeing snow today. We saw snow uh, last Friday as well. And so when we see some of these patterns, we know that we're in um, this, this, this backward spring. So what are some of the other elements of, of what climate change looks like across the state? Well, you know, usually the temperatures at night go down. Well, they're not going down as low as they used to. And so that's another way that we can look at, at climate change. So the nighttime temperatures are actually getting warmer. And, and that's one of the clearest signals of, of climate change, looking at, at these nighttime temperatures. And it, it's across all of our seasons in here. So winter, spring, summer, and fall, we're seeing that pattern where the nighttime temperatures are, are actually getting warmer over time. So that's one way that we can look at this, okay? Another way that we can look at it is how much precipitation are we getting? Are we getting rain um, in, in the seasons that we would usually get rain? Are we getting um, lack of rain or um, drought conditions? And where some of these changes are, are most observed are in the summertime, okay? And also in the fall. So we're looking to see when, when are we getting uh, less rain or more rain and which season it's actually taking place in. So precipitation is another way of, of looking at that climate change signal. So if we were in the big auditorium and it got to this point and I, I said, what are some of the sectors that are susceptible to a changing climate? And you know, the hands would be going up like this and be like, oh yeah, let's talk about this, let's talk about that. But we're, we're in our, our, our team setting, our, our Zoom setting here. And so let me just show you these so we can talk about them. So we can think about emergency management. We can think about health. We can think about forestry, uh, agriculture, tourism, infrastructure. These are some of the sectors that sort of come to mind when we think about our susceptibility to, to climate change and climate change impacts. So let's talk about human health. And... Uh, if you think about it nationally, the cutoff temperature for heat waves is 90 degrees, but we don't usually see a lot of 90 degree days here across the North Country. So uh, a few years ago, the Department of Health worked with um, uh, a postdoc that I had, Dr. Evan Oswald, to actually see what's the value that makes sense for Vermont. And that value turns out to be 87 degrees. So we're now starting to warn when we get to 87 or when 87 is on forecast so that um, if, if there are any vulnerable populations who would need to have access to this information, we're making sure that we're doing that science in service of society and getting our, our, our words out there in terms of, of, of warnings. Um, Ozone at the, the lower levels, critically important to us. Lyme disease is one of those pieces that we still need to understand and do a little bit more about in terms of, of climate change. So it's one of those things that I, I always flag because it's, it's a to-do in terms of, of, of better understanding how um, climate change will affect um, Lyme disease. And then we've, we've noticed that, that folks have, have started moving in relation to changing weather and climate patterns. And so um, this diaspora, this movement of people, um, uh, for example, from the coast inland, from other states to Vermont, um, uh, we, we can think about these various ways that we can look at migration as a result of our changing climate. So looking at that 87 degree uh, value a little bit um, deeper, we can see it tends to, to occur with different frequencies in, in the 14 counties across the state. And so where is it most pronounced? We've got the lower Connecticut Valley in here, as well as the Champlain Valley across it in here. So we're looking to see this, this climatology of how many times do we actually hit this, this 87 degree value. Okay, so let's talk about veg. And when we talk about vegetation, I know there were some questions um, submitted in the Google Doc before the, the lecture itself that, that talked about um, drought, that talked about um, what, what should be grown or some of these other elements. So let's, let's look, take a look at this. And, and one way of looking at this is to use the plant hardiness map. And on the left-hand side um, is the old map that came from the National Arboretum. And on the right-hand side is the Arbor Day map. And the, the Arbor Day map is, is pretty cool because it shows you not just the, the sort of changes in the zones. And I, I, I know that if you 
um, or an avid a farmer or an, an avid um, a tree planter or an, an avid gardener, you have used a lot of these um, maps to actually uh, determine which is the most appropriate set of plants for, for the zone that you live in. And so I really like this map because it, it shows you subzones really nicely, but even better, if you look at this online, you're actually able to sort of zoom in and, and, and get down to a more finer scale in where you live to be able to, to make that choice a little bit better. The map on the left was a static map and it was kind of hard to read, but this, this other one is more of an interactive map. So if you haven't played around with this before, you might want to make a note of it in terms of, of using this Arbor Day Foundation plant hardiness map to look. So thinking about um, plant choices, thinking about susceptibility, this has a, a feeling of, of different seasons because we have different challenges in different seasons. And so we're in spring right now. We know that if we plant too soon, it's, it's liable to, 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 to have um, frost occurring. Um, in the summertime, we have the challenges of either heat waves or drought conditions. We know that frost can occur in the fall as well. And then we have um, sometimes in the wintertime, it warms up, plants awake, they start to photosynthesize, the temperature drops, and then you have um, losses occurring. So, so thinking about all of these vegetation pieces, not just as a bulk number, but as a, a seasonal piece in here. The other piece in all of this is, is thinking of it from a forestry perspective, from a tree crop perspective. And up until about, I would say, two to three years ago, um, we, we had never seen the emerald ash borer in the state. And it has now arrived in the state. And why is that important? It's because it's an invasive species. And it sets up a different sort of dynamic for our, 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 our standing biomass because we've never had that particular um, pest in, in the state before. So we've, we've, we're looking to see how, how these invasive species are actually encroaching in places that they have not before as the climate continues to change. A couple of weeks ago, we had the National Weather Service put out a wildfire threat because of how dry our landscape was. And then when we think about some of those other elements of, of, of the frost that we just talked about, of the plants waking up in, in the middle of winter and then having to go back dormant, that has implications for um, commercial species like Christmas trees, for example. So, so we, we, we need to, to sort of keep all of these moving pieces in mind as we look at, at the influence of climate change from a vegetation perspective. And so uh, the Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation has been monitoring changes in growing seasons and changes in what these mean for sugar maples. And so we are seeing the growing season um, lengthening, at least at this particular site in, in Underhill. And we're also seeing the, the, the timing of when the buds break also changing. So I know um, I have a Norway maple here in, in my, my front yard. And so looking to see when did that Norway maple do bud break this year versus some of the other years is yet another way that we can look at how our, our, our vegetation is responding to our changing climate. And then um, ozone, which is produced from um, industrial activities, from our driving our cars at the ground level, it is an irritant for us as human beings, but it's also an irritant for vegetation. And so looking at the species that are particularly um, susceptible to, to ozone as this um, may increase with our changing climate is, is one of those additional pieces that we can look at from a climate change perspective. And when we, we bring this into the realm of our recreation and tourism, here are some sugar maples, and this is what drought looks like when it affects your sugar maples. And when, when that happens in the summertime, we know that it, it has a, a bearing on what happens in the fall, especially with the color, like how brilliant the color is and all of the sugars um, that are, are being produced in, in the, the, the leaves throughout the summer and then into the fall. So drought is a critical piece for us. And we see it not just in our maples, but we also see it in the hydrology. So when the lack of precipitation extends for long enough, like it has over the last few months or so, we're going to see larger water bodies actually responding to that. So here is, is um, Lake Champlain up in the St. Albans region. And 
The dark line here is, is where the water would tend to be, usually on average. And this is how far out it, it, it was in, in 2006 because of the ongoing drought that we were actually seeing at that particular time. So you may have seen pictures like that with some of the, the lakes and ponds that are closer to, to where you live um, in various parts of the kingdom or various other regions across um, from where you're, you're tuning in. So infrastructure is another one that is critically important um, in terms of its susceptibility, its vulnerability to, to climate change. And some of the pieces that uh, fall under infrastructure are in roads. We talk about electrical grid. We talk about critical buildings, critical infrastructure, and, and the ways in which, you know, particularly high temperatures might sort of um, compromise the integrity of these various systems. And when we, we look at, at these um, high temperatures and, 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 and the, the way that it compromises a system, what we're seeing, and this is, this is a, a, a schematic of some of the ways that we can understand a changing climate in changing not just the average conditions, but more importantly, changing the extreme conditions. So if, if things shift towards warmer conditions, it's not just the average that's changing, but it's also how many more times do you get hot conditions? How many more times do you get heat waves, these extreme high temperatures? And then are you getting fewer of these cold days or these cold temperatures? And so that's one piece in, in looking at this susceptibility. The other piece is, uh, from a precipitation perspective, we're getting fewer times when there's light rain, but more times of these um, heavy downbursts. And so two ways in which we can look at that, because it, it then becomes important if you get more heavy rain, that's more flooding type conditions. If you get less rain, then it sets up drought conditions. And so we're looking at, at how this influences all of these elements of our infrastructure, particularly whether we're coastal, for example, here, whether it's the subways or this shot, which could have been from you know, the southern part of the state in the Connecticut Valley, which was particularly affected by tropical storm Irene. So why is why do we have such a, a vulnerability? And part of it is because of our, our topography. And uh, as as a state, we have um, a lot of of steep slopes, a lot of narrow valleys, so that the rivers are at the base of these valleys. And usually, from a historical perspective, the roads are built very close to the the rivers themselves. And so, whenever uh, one of these rivers overtops its bank. Uh, we have that inherent vulnerability to the roads being washed out. And so you've got um, places that have repeat occurrences of these floods, for example, um, this sort of Jay Peak Montgomery region. And then we saw that um, come to a point in our tropical storm Irene, where this is the town of Waterbury here. We've got I-89 running along here, the blue lines, and this is Winooski here. And when it, it, it jumped the banks, it sort of um, uh, cut off Waterbury and isolated it for a while. So this, 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 this um, vulnerability because of our topography, because of our historical um, landscape is, is critically important in looking at how our infrastructure is, is, is um, being affected. So thinking about Irene, Thinking about um, the roads that were affected, we, we were able to sort of map this um, with a lot of the, the information that was coming in through the Vermont Agency of Transportation, VTRANS. And so a lot of these colored lines that you see here, the reds and the yellows and the greens, are, are maps that were, or sorry, are roads that were affected during Irene. And then the dark lines were roads that were affected in 1927. Really, really hard to read, so let me blow this up for you. And if, if you look at it, you see that the roads that were affected in 1927, again, those are the dark lines, and the ones that were affected in Irene, those are the various colors, they match up pretty much like this. So that allows us to understand the ongoing vulnerability of various um, road systems across the state. And it all also gives us a heads up or a leg up in in trying to, to uh, mitigate against because we know where some of these choke points or, or pieces of vulnerability are. So I've talked about um, hurricanes a lot. So why, why do we keep talking about hurricanes? What is the, the concern about hurricanes? Do we tend to get a lot of hurricanes? And so um, going back 
thinking about it. Here's Irene in here on the right hand side, um, making landfall in the Carolinas, in Jersey, uh, again in New York before coming up the Connecticut Valley. And some folks may remember that we also had um, Hurricane Floyd back in 1999 following a similar path. And if we go back through the historical record, we can see other times in the past when we have had hurricanes move up into the North Country and the, the way in which it produces a lot of precipitation depending on where it actually moved. By the way, Hurricane Floyd actually produced more rainfall in Vermont than Irene did. Floyd produced 14 inches of rain on the top of Mansfield, but we did not flood because we were in a, a two-year drought at that time. So that going from flood to drought is, is, is something that is important for us to always appreciate across the state. So just looking at some of these um, hurricanes over time, um, this is some work from uh, Richard Valley with the um, Northeast River Forecast Center. And what he did was to look at all of the hurricanes um, in the 1800s all the way through to the 2000s that have moved across um, parts or close to Rhode Island and they would naturally continue sort of towards us as well here. So we can actually see some of those, those patterns in here sort of crisscrossing um, the southern part of, 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 of New England into the North Country in here. And if I break this down over time, so the first part of, of the last century, see a lot of those hurricanes and the ways that they moved up and, and struck us. Second half of the 21st, uh, 20th century, and again, we're seeing um, again, that movement, uh, particularly uh, close to the Connecticut Valley. And then if we come into the, the, the first 15 years of the 21st century, we're seeing um, some of those, 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 those um, tropical systems giving us a little bit more of a glancing blow because they're starting off in the Gulf of Mexico and then making their way off towards us. And of course, this one here is Irene. So... Why is it important to look at hurricanes? Why is it important to look at, at precipitation? Why is it important to look at how much is, is, is falling from the sky? And the answer to that is because if we're planning for, for climate change and we're planning for where um, places are vulnerable to certain amounts of rainfall, we need to know what those values are. And so this map here shows you all of these projected um, values of um, the amount of rain that can occur in a 24 hour period that would have the chance of occurring with a, a, a one in a hundred year um, return interval. And this is the new information, which is super great because um, this is the information that the Agency of Transportation uses for planning culverts going out into the future. This is, is the information that we had before this new this new map. And when you look at it, you're like, oh my goodness me, it's like night and day, the amount of, of detail that the new information shows you and how much better we're able to plan for future um, precipitation events because we're now using the most up-to-date information, which shows you the increase in, in rainfall that we've been seeing in, in, the, in the recent time. So it's always important to, to make sure that we're updating our values as we get more and more information coming on in. And, and, and thinking about hurricanes and thinking about the, 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 the ways that um, when they uh, produce disasters, they are very costly. Um, that's one of the, the things that we can look at in looking at um, trying to plan for um, very, very severe events. And which ones should we be planning for? This is what this diagram shows you really, really well. So it goes back to 1980. And it shows all of the events that have produced at least a billion dollars worth of damage across the entire U.S. in a particular year. And if you look closely, you'll notice that the green is what sort of pops out most. And that is actually severe storms, right? So severe storms that will produce a lot of that damage. And last year, so 2020, we also had a, a lot of, of um, tropical cyclones producing a lot of, of damage. And if you remember back in, in 2020, we had at least five of these landfalling hurricanes producing a lot of that damage. So that's part of the reason why thinking about hurricanes and understanding and appreciating hurricanes and tropical systems critically important. So thinking about that, thinking about um, 
our, our vulnerability from a landscape perspective, thinking about our vulnerability from a, a human perspective, putting all of these pieces together are some of the things that are, are critically important to me in my role as a state climatologist in, in, in the larger context of the entire organization that I'm the president of because um, all of us are um, applied climatologists who are here to serve society in whatever capacity that we are in. And so we, we need to make sure that we are um, are responsive and understanding to all of the the ways in which um, we as human beings are vulnerable, so that we can um, better make our response. Um, and so, if 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 I were to try and bring together that whirlwind, that fire hose, that massive amount of information that I I just walked us through, if if there's nothing else, um, I always try and 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 sort of end with this notion of all of these pieces are a system. And so we, we really should be doing a system approach to understanding not just the landscape, not just climate, not just climate change, not just disasters, not just hazards, but all of the things that we're looking at, human systems, physical systems, land systems, all right? And as we, we notice, things change over space and time. So, so that ability to look at, at variations over various parts of our state, various parts of our region over long periods of time, critically important for us to understand exactly how these changes are playing out. And looking at, at who's vulnerable from a human perspective, which parts of our landscape are vulnerable from a natural perspective, so that we can then take that information and use it to mitigate in the cases that we can, or adapt in the cases that we can't. So this is going to take time. It has been taking time. So we're in this for the long haul. But if nothing else, these last 14 months have sort of solidified for me that um, the resilience of us as human beings is absolutely critical and, and cherished and is what will help us to, to, to continue to um, address some of these challenges that we're facing. So um, for all of my K through 12 members of the audience here, if you're thinking about a career in climatology and you're thinking about what classes to take or if to do AP, so forth, um, look into what's available at your high school in either math or physics, environmental science, geography. Um, if you have the, the, the chance and the ability to, to maybe do an internship or to, to visit the museum and talk to a scientist or work with a scientist, um, that would be awesome. And then um, see if you can start thinking about integrating a lot of, of ideas that seem to be different, but they're really not. And then as I was growing up, I loved watching um, PBS or um, National Geographic because it always sort of connects you to, to the natural world and the ways in which all of these pieces of weather, climate, and climate change sort of go together. So my last little shout out is yesterday, Google Earth um, launched a, a time lapse that shows you ways of looking at, at um, climate change over time. So um, when you're finished here and you're still sort of like, oh my goodness me, let, let's, let's, let's look at some more stuff. Um, go to Google Earth if you have the, the chance to do that and check out this time-lapse tool. I, I will assure you it is nothing less than amazing. So with that, I thank you for um, your attention. I thank you for being here. I thank the entire um, EDI com um, series um, community for the invitation to, to be your keynote. Um, and I thank you all, wish you all a lovely evening. And let's turn it over to the Q&A part. All right, thank you so much, Leslie Ann. So I'm Allison Golka millard and I'm gonna chime in here. Um, I'm the director of programs at the Fairbanks Museum, and I'm going to start relaying some of the questions that have come in to Leslie Ann. Um, Would you I'm like me start to stop sharing my screen? Um, Allison, sorry. Would you like me to stop sharing my screen? Or? Whatever you'd like to do. Yeah, let's, okay. let's do that. Let me know if you've taken it off. Um, I don't. Does that work? Yes. All right. You're now the spotlight. I am. Okay, great. 
<laughs> I'm going to turn the spotlight back back to Leslie Ann in just a minute here. So I'm going to start with a question that came in from Charlie Cobb from Westford, Vermont. Um, and he said, how will climate change impact Vermont's skiing and maple sugaring industries? I know you touched a little bit about on maple trees and how they're affected by drought. Um, but just to talk a little bit more about those industries in particular and what you see as um, their greatest effects. Right. So one, one of the things, um, Charlie, that was a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, so there are two elements of, of climate change that we can look at look at uh, from, from a skiing perspective. One of them is how much um, snow actually falls during the season itself and, and whether it falls as snow or it falls as rain. And as, as, it, as, it, as the temperatures continue to warm, um, there's that very fine line between whether it falls as rain versus snow. So that's one piece. The other piece is um, if there's no precipitation at all, so we, we, they're in a snow drought, then we have that chance to do withdrawals from the lakes and rivers um, that are close to the um, that are close to, to the, the ski resort itself. And so um, the, the question then becomes, if we went into that winter season in a drought, those those levels would be lower. And so um, this this is one of the pieces that I know folks across the state, at least in the state agencies, are, are, are absolutely um, critically looking at because withdrawals is going to be one of those pieces that is going to be a climate change um, impact that we need to address as a state. So there's a lot of work left to be done a lot of moving pieces in terms of snow, snow droughts, snow withdrawals, and then how that plays out in the landscape. Um, so that's 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 the the, the more alpine um, resorts. Uh, if if we're talking about the cross country, uh, lack of precipitation, lack of snowfall is is also going to affect the, the viability of of our cross country skiing enterprises as well. Um, we also had a question come in from Craig Line from Callis. Um, he said, I'm a maple producer for more than 40 years, and I have had more, more of what I'll call bad years than good over the past 10. And could this be linked to climate change? Mm -hmm. So thanks for that question, Craig. And I think um, uh, sugaring is, is one of those sort of like indicators that we can use to look at, at climate change impacts. And part of it has to do with the temperatures. So I know there's a, a certain critical temperature range at a certain time of the year and a certain diurnal range that we need to have uh, occurring. And when that doesn't occur at the time that we should have it, so like March and April, then that, that sort of affects the season. So that's one piece in there. The other piece that um, you're probably seeing some of, um, Craig, is that if we have those swings in January and March, that also affects um, the sort of health of, of, your, of your, your species. And then the third thing is if we were in a drought the year prior, so that the health of the, the, the trees going into that winter could also be compromised. So all of these pieces moving together, when you combine that with um, a snowpack that wasn't deep enough, so you're not getting the sort of prote protective um, elements of, of a deep snowpack coming out of the winter and getting into that sugaring season, are all of these pieces that we're also um, looking at. So I would, I'd love to, to chat with you more, Craig, about some of your observations, some of the data that you've been recording over the last 40 years and how, how I could sort of um, combine that with, with the, the historical records, the temperatures, the, the precipitation, so that we build out that story a little bit more. So thanks for that, and I look forward to hearing from you. Great. Um, I'm going to move on to a question from Peg Elmer Huff from Cabot, Vermont. And she said, after this past summer's drought, when our well went dry for three weeks in September, we are searching for water-saving roof systems for use in our gardens. Um, and she wondered, couldn't Front Porch Forum or something similar be used to query how many homes had dry wells in September of 2020 and mapping those results? So kind of bringing together that sort of data um, and, and seeing how it could be used for the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. Peg, you read my mind. Because as a geographer, that's where my mind automatically goes in terms of, of putting all of this on a map so that everybody could see what the pattern is and, and, and 
whether they are some of your neighbors, for example, or whether it is a certain part of the state, because once you have a map like that, then you can start putting it together with um, what are the soils? What is the geology? Where are you on the landscape? Are you on a hillside? Are you in a valley? What are some of those pieces that um, are, are helping to either exacerbate why you, your well was dry for three weeks? And it's one of those that I would love to, to partner with anybody who is um, willing or, or wanting to do this because it just helps us to flesh out the picture of where the drought is because drought is a very, very interesting phenomenon. It, it varies rapidly across the landscape because the soils vary rapidly across the landscape. And so just knowing who's experiencing what helps us to better understand the question. So next time you ask that, Peg, we can say in the 2021 drought, most of these severe impacts were in this part of the state. And we know that they had these soils and we know that these storm systems moved here or here and so forth. So again, just like Craig, I would love to, to follow up with you to, to see if we can put some of these things together in one place so that we can learn from them for the next time. On a similar note, we had a number of questions come in that had to relate to um, people who are interested in gardening and planting trees and um, thinking about what zone, what um, hardiness zone we would be in, like you like you spoke about. So um, Tim Thompson of East Burke asked, are we going to be in zone five or zone seven or something worse? Um, how, do we how do we predict that moving forward? Um, and what about drought? So, you know, kind of predicting how far things are going to go and at what pace. And I'll also add on to that, um, that uh, people are wondering what specifically we can be thinking about for what gardeners can be thinking about. So Ellen Hayes and East Callis said, what trends um, can gardeners anticipate in the next five to 10 years? That's a lot of questions. And so let's see how many I can remember to answer. Um, so when I first, when we first moved out to Vermont, I remember going into the, the garden of supply, gardening supply um, place because we were looking to, to purchase species. And I said, are these drought resistant? And at that time, um, it wasn't as common to ask that question. Now it's a little bit more common. And so I think, um, so I've been here for 24 years. And this is about the sixth or eighth drought that we've been through as a state. And droughts occur in every single climate, regardless of how wet you are or how dry you are. So asking about and selecting species that have some drought tolerance or some drought resistance is not a bad idea. And to the extent that we can um, start bringing that more into the public lexicon, I think is gonna be important because um, droughts have happened in the past and they, they will continue to happen. And so it's part of that, that variability that we talked about. So yes, we are getting wetter, but yes, we still continue to experience drought. And so it's, it's that sort of multi-prone, um, making sure that we are covering our bases so that we don't become vulnerable so one thing, because we're spending uh, more emphasis on that. Uh, in terms of the question about uh, zone seven, I uh, am not an agriculturalist, so I can't tell you all of the various zones, but I know the zones have shifted over the last uh, few decades. And so what I could do is to see from my um, US Department of Agriculture colleagues, if they know if a, a new uh, mapping system is coming out in the near future. So um, the, the person who asked that question, if you wouldn't mind dropping me a line, I would be more than happy to pass that along to my USDA colleagues to find out if they know a bit more about some of those shifts and, and whether those shifts are, are gonna be um, in new, new maps and if the new maps are on the horizon or not. Uh, I think I missed a couple pieces of, of some of the questions, Alison. Um, just thinking about what gardeners need to be thinking about in the coming years in terms of changes due to climate change. So I think flexibility is the name of the game. 
And part of it is from an atmospheric perspective, but part of it is also because of, of who we are as a state and knowing that a lot of our soils are clay soils and clay soils have a more of a susceptibility to dry conditions than some other types of loamy soils. And so uh, if you're on a rocky type soil, it's also a different set of vulnerability. So I think um, to the extent that we can be flexible in terms of the, the plants that we grow, important. Uh, when we think about the choices of plants, it's not just from a zone perspective. It's not just from a moisture perspective. Um, it's, it's also from a temperature perspective. So if you have warm temperatures, but you don't have the rain, then your plants are not going to thrive, even if the zone says that they should thrive. So again, it's that multi-pronged systems approach. When you look at which plants you choose, uh, make sure that they are um, tolerant to a couple different things, not just temperature, not just carbon fertilization, but also um, moisture susceptibility as well. And just to follow up, I saw a question came in from Brad in Newberry, Vermont, that said, uh, in what ways can you use your position to help Vermont's agriculture sector improve soils to hold and retain more water and resist flooding and erosion events? Okay. So I think um, one way of answering that is I'm on the Vermont Climate Council right now, and we are working towards creating um, the Vermont Climate Action Plan, which is due uh, the beginning of December. And one of the pieces that I want to um, help bring to the council is looking at all of the ways in which um, climate and climate change affect us, including water resources, including our working lands, including our agricultural lands. And so to the extent that I can um, bring some of that information and sort of elevate it in, in the sort of effects of climate change would help us um, in terms of moving some of that conversation forward. Because as, as a geographer, I like to see both the forest and the trees. And so I think that's why I keep um, focusing so much on systems, because if we miss part of the system, then we're going to miss um, whether it's the, the vegetation piece, whether it's the water piece, whether it's the sequestration piece, whether it's the healthy soils piece, whether it's the temperature piece. So all those pieces have to, 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 to come together in a way that makes sense for us as an entire state and the systems across the state. So if you... Um, the, the, the person who asked that question, if you have um, data or, or maps or information or studies or observations or photos or whatever that you'd like to um, share with me so I can make sure those get included, I'd be more than happy to, to chat with you as well. Um, so this next question comes from Lyndon Higgins, and she said, I've seen it argued that individual mitigation strategies for people or families will be will be sufficient, insufficient for significant reduction of rate of accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere. What do you think are the most impactful targets to push for systemic change in U.S. carbon output? Okay, so Lyndon, that is a great question, and I think... Um, Mitigation strategies are not um, within my bailiwick. Um, as part of the Vermont Climate Council, there is a subgroup called the Cross-Sector Mitigation Committee. And the, the, the experts on that committee are the ones who would be better able to answer your question in terms of actual targets for mitigation um, from a, a, a carbon dioxide reduction perspective. And so again, please email me so that I can put you in touch with the folks who are are better able to, to respond to that question. So I'm not punting the question, but I'm, I'm gonna try and connect you to the, the best response. And that's part of my role. To go back to the last person who asked that question, what my role is, part of my role is, is always to be a portal between what the questions and the needs are and who is best able to answer it if I don't have that answer. Great. So I'm going to um, give you one from John Bongartz in St. Johnsbury, and he said, could you please comment on the effect of climate change on the spread of Lyme disease? 
So John, thank you for that question. And um, that is one of the pieces that is on the to-do because it, it is critically important. It is one of the pieces that we did not um, address sufficiently in, in the last climate assessment. And so um, unfortunately, I cannot give you a, a more detailed answer because we're still working on that, but it, it's a critically important piece from a human health perspective. Um, and then we had one from Lynn Wurzberg, who asked, is the Northeast expected to become vulnerable to wildfires in the future due to climate change? So wild, wildfires, Lynn, um, are, are also one of those pieces that we have to keep an eye out for. Um, like I said, we had a, a wildfire threat uh, a couple of weeks ago because the ground was so dry, the atmosphere was so dry, we hadn't received precipitation in, in quite a number of weeks. And so whenever we're in a, a multi-year drought like we are right now, at this particular time of the year in particular, we, we do see that spring wildfire threat. And if it continues to, to the summer, we also have that summer wildfire threat. And um, if, if we think about the incidence of wildfire, it may not be to the same extent as we see in the West. So California, Arizona, for example, or in the South, like parts of Florida, but wildfires are still a threat to us, even though the, the risk is a little bit diminished. And one of the things that I, I did in using all of those historical records that, that um, I showed during the, the lecture itself is I went back and I looked at what are some of the most severe dry conditions that we've seen as a state? And they're in the late 1700s, early 1800s, where the wetlands dried out so much that the wetlands um, combusted and they burned for not just a day, not just weeks, but for months on end. And so if our landscape ever gets that dry, that is as, as, as dry as it has been in, in the historical record. So wildfires are something that uh, we shouldn't think is a Western problem or a Southern problem. It can and has occurred here in the state. So sort of on that note, John Haddon asked, can you further discuss the getting wetter idea versus the seemingly more frequent drought conditions? So the, the getting wetter idea piece, John, is um, part of the, the, the understanding that as the atmosphere warms, the amount of energy to do evaporation into the atmosphere also goes up. So the amount of water that is in the atmosphere also increases. And if you've got more water in the atmosphere, um, part of that um, condenses and becomes clouds and, and, and therefore you get more precipitation falling as a result. So, so the, the warming of the atmosphere and the more precipitation sort of go together and that's the wetter part. At the same time, if storm systems move in different places, so somebody else gets your precipitation, then the difference in the storm track is what helps to set up uh, dry conditions. So it could be raining, it could be raining more just to the north of you or to the south of you, right? It didn't pass over you. And so looking at all of those helps us to understand why you could be seeing more precipitation and at the same time, you're also seeing droughts. We had a question from John Jose in Montpelier, and he said, I'm interested in being able to access a database of meteorological trends in Vermont so I can compare daily temperatures we are now experiencing with Vermont's historic average and historic average temperatures. So is there a good source to go to for this information? And I should mention that the Fairbanks Museum is one of those potential sources. We do have historical records um, mm -hmm. on our Eye on the Sky website, and we can link that in the chat. Yep, absolutely. And then just send me a quick email and I'll send you some sites so that you could do that too. All right. Um, Julie, Julia Anderson from Topsom, Vermont asked, what do you know about carbon holding sphagnum moss? Um, I'm afraid I, I don't know the term. 
I, I'm guessing so, it has to do with carbon sequestration by sphagnum moss. But um, Julia, if you're in the audience, um, we can try to unmute you or you can request to be unmuted. Otherwise, um, we can follow up on that one later too. So I'll move on to, um, let's see, one by Michael Loinian from Plainfield, Vermont. And he says, uh, how does the state of Vermont plan to end the sale of internal combustion autos like California and Washington have done? Oh, um, yeah, I, I'm afraid I can't answer that one either. Uh, that sounds like a question for either one of my colleagues at um, Agency of Natural Resources or uh, Legal Counsel. So again, I would be more than happy to connect um, the person who asked the question with um, either Legal Counsel or somebody at ANR who might be able to answer that. Because that's a statewide de decision. That's a statewide, um, yeah. That's a, that's a statewide piece. And we have linked, um, we've linked a, your bio at UVM in the chat. So that has your UVM email address on it um, for anyone interested in, in following up. Uh, we had a question from Walter Norman and he said, it seems with climate change so far, snowfall, snowfall has remained fairly steady and the number of major snowstorms has gone up. However, it seems to me that average snow depth has gone down. Is the way in which Vermont receives snow and the way in which it falls changing? Um, so you've got snow fall, snow depth and change as part of that question, right? So one of the things that we can look at when we think about um, climate change and, and snow events. Um, part of that goes back to the amount of moisture in the atmosphere and when it, when it, when it um, falls out, if more of it falls, then the total falling snow is, is gonna increase. Um, once it falls and you, th you think about the snow pack, which is a snow depth piece in there, um, that is then uh, subject to uh, the conditions that cause your snow back, snow pack to ablate or to, to decrease. Some of that is the, the air temperature. Some of it is whether it evaporated without melting. Some of it if, is, is related to um, whether it melted all quickly or whether you had rain on snow. And snow is, is one of the biggest um, pieces that's hard to, to measure and to quantify. And so um, there's certain elements of that that I could actually refer the person who asked that question to a colleague in my department, um, Dr. Beverly Wemple, who is a snow hydrologist. And I could also refer um, the person who asked that question to Dr. Jason Schaefer at Linden, who's also a snow hydrologist. All right, so I think we're just gonna do one or two more here. Um, we had uh, one come in from Jamie Dimmick and um, in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. They said, what is the most significant action Vermont residents can take uh, to help with climate change? And I know this is kind of talking about mitigation, but um, just from your personal perspective, if, if not um, a professional one, what are some of the things that Vermonters can do in your mind? I think lectures like this are awesome because it allows for the um, the sharing of knowledge. And I always think that knowledge is power. So to the extent that um, we can continue sharing some of that information so that um, individuals can make appropriate choices. Um, and, and why I say it like that is because as, as part of being on the Vermont Climate Council, um, one of our subcommittees is about just transitions. And we are very, very conscious and committed to making sure that um, all Vermonters are able to make the choices that are appropriate to them in their particular um, situation. And so, as a scientist, I prefer to share information than to say you should or you must. 
and then leave it up to individuals to make the choices that are appropriate for them, for their families, for um, for their particular situation. And so um, always happy to pass along different things that have worked in other regions, but a little less um, um, willing to, to say you should be doing, if that makes sense. That's great. I think we'll wrap it up there, Leslie. And so if you have any closing remarks, um, let us know. Um, I, I think the time has flown by. I know I have talked a lot and I haven't had that sort of back and forth that I love to have with um, folks sitting there in, in, in the audience. But I, I hope I was able to um, share some information that might be helpful. I'm really, really, really looking forward to, to being with my colleagues on the 5th of May um, to, to talk a little bit more from a panel setting. Um, I think in closing, it has been, again, my privilege to, to sort of kick off this particular series. It is um, awesome to have so many questions with so much depth, so much sophistication, so much knowledge behind them that I feel really, really fortunate to be state climatologist in this state. And so I'm going, I'm going to go on record and say that again. So I thank you all. For, for, for being here tonight. And please, please, please um, don't be afraid or um, whatever to, to reach out, even if it's to say hi, to ask for whatever you need. And I will try to link you up with the folks who are able to, to best able to serve you. So thank you again. Thank you for all of those wonderful comments in the chat. Um, and again, thank you to the Eddie series for having me.